Ladies and gentlemen, our program will now begin. Please welcome the CEO of the Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Hello, welcome. Thank you so very much. My name is Karen Tucker. I'm CEO at the Churchill Club. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. In the wake of major attacks on Sony, Target, OPM, Ashley Madison, and many others, cybersecurity, the topic of our discussion this evening, has taken center stage in boardrooms, across the media landscape, and in conversations of national security and defense. Tonight we are privileged to have with us four distinguished leaders to share their views about up-to-the-minute cybersecurity issues, trends, strategies, and implications for the future. They are Ken Shi of Fortinet, Mike Brown of Symantec, Mark McLaughlin of Palo Alto Networks, and Chris Young of Intel Security Group. Now, although they are competitors, the four companies led by our speakers have chosen to work together as part of an organization called the Cyber Threat Alliance to share threat information in good faith with the ultimate aim to better protect their organizations and their customers. Here to lead them in discussion is Danny Yadrin, cybersecurity reporter from the Wall Street Journal. But before we begin, some thanks are in order. First, to our program partners, Fortinet, Intel Security, Palo Alto Networks, and Symantec. Thank you so much for making this possible. <laughs> Special thanks also to Mark Farley of Deloitte, Drew Del Mateo, and Sandra Wheatley of Fortinet. A few words about Churchill Club for our new guests. We are a preeminent technology and business forum operating here in the San Francisco Bay Area since 1985. Whenever we have speakers who come to the stage, we always respectfully request that they refrain from pitching, but rather look at this appearance as an opportunity to advance collective understanding, to add new insights to the conversation, and to shine a light on opportunities for innovation, for economic growth, and societal benefit. So we've been privileged to be convening people and with one another and important ideas since around the time of Windows 1.0. <laughs> uh, next up, the morning of November 18, we present the president of Stanford University and the chancellor of UC Berkeley talking about the future of uh, higher education and what's at stake. We'll have plenty of other exciting programs for you in this, our 30th anniversary year. I'll just mention a couple of them. On January 21st, we have Brad Katsuyama of IEX and Flash Boys fame, together with the author Michael Lewis. And then on uh, March 1st, we're going to welcome the Oscar-nominated actor James Kahn with business and leadership lessons from The Godfather. <laughs> For more on these and other upcoming programs, you know you can always get the details at churchillclub.org. One last thing, if you are tweeting tonight, please do use the hashtag Churchill Club, and you will find other Twitter pointers in your programs. So with that, let's give a very warm Churchill Club welcome to our speakers. Folks, um, so as mentioned, my name is Danny Yadrin. I am the cybersecurity reporter for the Wall Street Journal. I'm based up in San Francisco, uh, and that beat these days ranges everything from all of the incidents uh, previously mentioned to some of the stuff um, with surveillance and what some call uh, cyber war. Um, but we have much more interesting people here than me. Uh, we have Michael Brown. Um, the chief executive of Symantec uh, since 2014. Um, and he's previously 
uh, the chairman and CEO of Quantum Storage. Um, we have Mark McWathlin, right there. Hey, these are actually in order. What do you know? <laughs> well, we don't know that yet. I think that was my design. <laughs> Um, the chair and CEO of Palo Alto Networks, um, and he's pre previously the president of VeriSign, um, which plays a key role in the management of the internet um, with some root name servers. Um, he's also worked at Signio, um, and I'm going to mispronounce the name of, is it Carer? Or how do you, oh, don't even worry about that. Uh, <laughs> so long. So. We'll just move on. He's also on the board Sorry, of Opower and Qualcomm. Uh, Ken G, uh, the CEO and chairman of Fortinet, uh, founded in 2000, um, and he has worked through a, a string of security companies. His first SIS um, while he was at Stanford in 1993. Um, and then Chris Young, we have the general manager of Intel Security. Um, that includes brands such as McAfee, um, which is, you know, both known for antivirus and the antics of a, a certain former executive. <laughs> <laughs> He's running for president, I heard. <laughs> I don't think Intel would hire him these Sorry. days. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Um, before that, he was uh, the B VP uh, at Cisco Security, um, also an exec at RSA, uh, the security unit of EMC and VMware. Um, so obviously, you know, these are some very accomplished folks in the business of security, which is, you know, a, a multi-billion dollar industry uh, that is growing as the, the cyber threat is growing. And so whenever I talk to my editors about the business of cybersecurity, they sort of cut me off mid-sentence. They go, yeah, 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 but, but if this business is so big and growing, why does this keep happening? Um, the, the Targets, the Home Depots, the Ashley Madisons. And I realize you know, that sounds like an unfair question, but I, I'm curious for your take. To a lay person, despite the security industry, why do we keep reading about these things? Whoever wants to. Well, I'll take a stab at that. I, I think that's like uh, looking at the progress in the medical industry over the last 100 years and saying, why do people still get sick? Uh, what the industry is doing to stop attacks is actually pretty staggering because there's uh, by some estimates, 80 to 90 million attacks a year. So it's, at, at Symantec, we analyze 10 trillion security incidents a year. So it's amazing there aren't more breaches that happen. So the industry clearly needs to play the cat and mouse game with the attackers who get ever more sophisticated, but uh, they will continue to try and evade whatever defensive techniques we put in place. So as we play that game, we're going to get smarter and better in protecting you, but uh, there's so many of them. They're so persistent. Uh, it's a very, very big problem. You know, also, uh, you see, Internet today is quite different than 40, 50 years ago when it started. That time, only connect some government, some university. Now, pretty much everybody uses Internet and all the applications that have Internet and also a lot of devices that connect to the Internet. So that's increased a lot of productivity, but also a lot of other risk because so far the internet architecture is still more connection based, address, IP address based. So you don't know what's in the other end. So they only deal with layer two, layer three issue. They don't look at what's the content, what's the application, what's the user behind. So that's where the security companies step in. And uh, so we have uh, 2 million 40 gate actually deployed globally, uh, 150 trillion connection every day. Uh, you can see how many risks that can be involved. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, connection. That's also what generates a lot of risk because you, you don't know what's in the other end. Uh, so that's the issue created. I think there's, um, <clears throat> I think while there's a lot happening in cyber today, look, the reality is most of cybersecurity has kind of been buried as a back office function in IT in most organizations for most of our history. It's only been the last couple of years that you know, the president of the United States is getting involved, that boards of directors are paying attention to the problem. So we have a huge debt in most organizations that now is finally their people are starting to say, okay, we need to pay this debt down. I mean, anybody who, you know, anybody who works in any company would tell you, like, most times you don't focus on fixing the problems until the, the CEO and the board kind of say, hey, this is a real problem, we're going we're gonna to go after it and fix it. This is a complex problem. It needs a lot of attention. And there's a huge debt 
and I think that debt is now starting to be paid, but the criminals are cashing in on the debt right now. Yeah, yeah, I think at real high level, uh, we're dealing with a, a math problem at the end of the day, and the, the math problem is that the, the cost of compute power has declined um, dramatically over time, and we'll keep, keep doing so. No reason that's going to change. Tons of productivity, as Ted mentioned, you know, has come off of that. Uh, from a security perspective, though, as the cost of compute power goes down, the number of sophistication attacks go up. It's just cheaper for attacks to occur. Um, so it's a highly automated adversary, right, um, enjoying that. On the flip side, all of us playing the, um, defense, good guys, right, we're working with a 50-year-old internet. Legacy architectures have built over decades, and that tends to be more and more manual, manual response. You have a highly automated adversary, and a very manual setup from a response to tech uh, protect uh, s situation. So the math is just dramatically, you know, out of whack. That's why it's happening all the time, right? So that math curve has to flip on its head. Like that's what ultimately has to happen at the end of the day is, is that the cost of a successful attack, not an attack, a successful attack has to go up um, exponentially from what it is today in order for the incidence of these things to drop. One of the financial analysts estimated that uh, the cost of a breach is 10 times what we're spending to defend against them. So oh, really? It illustrates what Mark is saying. So it is a math problem. We probably have never spent so much on cybersecurity as a society, but there's still, we're not spending enough to prevent it. And I, I want to come back to that, that cost of a breach later on in this conversation, but you all in your answers there mentioned something interesting where, you know, well, this is, the internet basically wasn't built for what we're doing with it. And, you know, you talk about math. Is it possible, you know, to actually fix this, uh, especially, at least on the back end or after the fact with security companies like yours? Um, you know, you, you called it a math problem. Can we ever solve that, that equation? Well, I'll start since I brought the method. Um, well, you know, there's been different theories on that. One is um, to, to redo the internet. <laughs> you know, people have said that with a straight face. <laughs> no, I don't. People, well, you know, there's been there's been some straight face. Well, there is something else. You know, there's the, there's a there's you know the uh, the military has their own version, right? You yeah. know, so there are there are things out there like that. Uh, the banking industry has talked about having a new internet just for the banking industry. Um, so I think that just goes to show the level of um, desperation, for lack of a better term, of you know using this legacy architecture to say let's just start over. Um, but in all those sort of conversations, you just immediately get to the point to say, well, the whole point of the Internet is it's all supposed to work together and talk to each other, right? And what Ken was saying earlier, you know, when you have a gazillion connections, that's supposed to be what's happening, right? That's why the Internet's so valuable. So um, the idea of building a new Internet that's more secure, uh, t technically, it generally always ends up by saying, yeah, nobody can, nobody can communicate with each other, right? That's how we're going to secure it. So that, that doesn't work out at the end of the day, right? So uh, yeah, things have to change about um, just accept that the Internet is what it is, right? And um, there may be things like IPv6 and certain things that get to improve it over time. Um, but you just have to be in on top of that uh, from an architecture perspective of doing things in a, in a totally next generation way on top of that. But you're not going to change the Internet. It's my opinion. But. Yeah, I do, think there's, <clears throat> I do think there's some models out there that we're seeing that, at least in my mind, have real promise for how we can, we can do a better, we can, we can better our, our architect some of the, the foundational security that we need. I'll just give you an example. So Apple's iOS and the iTunes model. You know, we see far fewer attacks and malware incidents in that kind of environment than we do in more open environments like we see with Windows and like we see, well, we classically have seen Windows and what we see in Android environments and that kind of thing. So the, the, the more, you know, the, if you take that analogy forward, you know, as we connect more devices that are purpose-built where you don't necessarily need to install, a user doesn't get to install whatever they want, the, the opportunity to build more closed-loop systems will create a more secure ecosystem for those elements that are built in that, in that way. So I think there are some models that are out there. I would offer that as one. I don't think it's going to fix all the legacy. I don't think it's going to fix everything, but I think we can actually start to create secure enclaves in that kind of connected experience world that, that we're headed towards very rapidly. Until you jailbreak it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's perfect, right? I mean, there's no perfect security in a physical world or, or, or virtual, but, but I do think there's some models we could look to that, that make some sense. So like gated communities, but all on the same highway or something? <laughs> well, I, Possibly. I think, I think we all, uh, as companies, have broad range of technologies that even to protect what exists uh, with the fragmented architectures that are out there, do a pretty good job of protecting folks. So we're working to make sure that 
even with what you have, uh, it can be protected if you take time to understand. I, I think another element is uh, the human element. So we're all technology companies, that's what we sell and we do, but a lot of the vulnerabilities that we create are because there's not awareness uh, that we need to behave differently because people are trying to get at our personal information. Uh, when we review what's happening at Symantec every month to protect uh, Symantec's environment, and I'm guessing my competitors are no different, about half of the potential incidents really are vulnerabilities we introduce because people are not that aware of the spear phishing that's going on, the email that comes to my admin, the email that comes to the CFO saying, please transfer $10 million into this bank account, all those silly things. Please look at these pictures you know, of this celebrity. Uh, people are pretty clever in terms of how they're engineering these attacks. So we are introducing a lot of those vulnerabilities by our behavior. So the technology can only go so far if we're not educating ourselves to this is happening, it's pervasive, and we should expect these kind of attacks in our email every day. Yeah, and also I see today's internet still, even 50 years, they're still using the, uh, the same IP address or protocol, even IPv4, IPv6 now. Uh, there's a no basic change. Uh, it's uh, just like all the routing, all the switching, still just connect people. They never look at what's the user behind, what's the content, what's the application. Uh, so that's making the traditional security quite vulnerable because they only look at the connection. That's the traditional firewall. They only look at who can connect in, who cannot. And, uh, but nowadays, <clears throat> there's so many ways you can bypass that internet connection, uh, bypass the firewall. Whether the mobile device, there's all like compromise, <clears throat> there's all, all kind of things you can bypass the traditional internet connect, get inside the company. So because inside the company, you can see it's still all layer two, layer three connection, whether the switching or some other device there, they're just, they, they just connect all the people they're supposed to be trusted. That's where internet originally designed for. It's all trust party <coughs> connect together. Now it's become a global sense. And there's a, so many other application flow on the internet which has a lot of value involved. Uh, so that's attract a lot of bad guys and see, hey, how I can distract all the value from there. So, but somehow the architecture now that addresses this issue. I think with the right architecture, they can reduce the threat there. But probably, uh, like Mike all said, it's really, you need to have a both the infrastructure and also you need to have some technology and also educate the people behind to using it to address the issue. No, totally. I was, um, we had Admiral Rogers from NSA at our, our tech conference last week and he said, seriously, He's thinking of our revoke clearances for people who click on phishing emails because it was one of the big breaches was because some lieutenant clicked on something. He's like, "You actually clicked on this? He's like, why are we letting you on dark?" <laughs> <laughs> um, but all right, Ken, you mentioned this, and, and Michael, you said this in your first response. Like, you know, this would be a lot worse if there weren't companies such as yourselves doing these things. You know, we're here in Silicon Valley. Um, a lot of companies starting up now are we're trying to start security companies. Um, or you know they're running companies that are going to have to interact with security vendors, and the hard part with the security industry is you're sort of you're, you're proving your value by proving something didn't happen. Uh, and I, I guess you know if you're talking to a young entrepreneur in this space, like how how do you go about proving you add value? Because there there's such a reputation for snake oil in this industry um, b because it is so buzzy right now. Well, I, I think you're able to demonstrate things that you're catching. I mean, this the industry's uh, for years been able to demonstrate if attacks come in, uh, how much are you catching. Now we're constantly trying to improve that, uh, but uh, I don't think you just have to uh, take it on faith uh, that there's nothing bad happening and these products don't work. It's quite the opposite. You can show with this attack, this technique will stop that. I think the problem with the startups, from my standpoint, is uh, there's a lot of clever ideas out there. Many of them are trying to attack a single uh, point a problem or there's a new technique. Mm -hmm. And the thought that as companies or as individuals, we're going to be able to integrate hundreds of different technologies uh, in running a company or uh, as an individual is nonsense. So what we're hearing from a lot of customers is enough already. Uh, thank you for the clever new ideas, but we've got to work with some vendors who can provide us at least a baseline of protection, and then we might pick one or two or three of these to integrate, but we can't be an integrator of 50 to 100 different technologies, so, so we've got latest techniques to solve all these point problems. Yeah, and also, like uh, Mark and Mike said, right now the offense cost is much lower than the defense cost. 
and there's uh, so many ways you can attack. And uh, <clears throat> there's uh, been so many applications and, uh, and so many devices you try to protect. And then when you try to defend, try to make secure, you, you try to secure all of them, it's pretty much all impossible. Uh, that's making the defense cost that get pretty high. And also the traditional way, whether you have a trust zone and trust zone starting broken, so you really need to go back to see, hey, what's my most important data information IP I can protect? That's where I go to the server, go to the data source, and also try to segregate inside the company, and also like isolate the most important data you will have. So that get more important, because traditionally, the, whether the, the trust zone or DMZ or parameter defense starting breaking out right now. I think, I think some of that complexity you see in, it, in our business as well, it, it, it mirrors our customers. You know, the, the customer, you know, one of the biggest enemies of our customers are their own organizational structure. And, you know, we talked to, like, we've talked now a little bit about how, you know, in the Internet's evolved very quickly, the technology architectures have evolved very quickly. Quickly, You know, if you think about it, most IT organizations kind of run the way they've been run for years and years and years and years, yet the attackers have changed their methodologies, like, a thousand times, you know, a, a week since that point in time. So, you know, if you're still, you know, I got a network security group, I got an endpoint group, I, you know, and it's, everybody's kind of doing their own thing and operating IT the way they did 15 years ago, there's no wonder that the effectiveness level against the attacker who's unbounded by cost, unbound, they're not going to get arrested because no one's really doing anything about it from a law enforcement perspective. I mean, they're just, they're operating with immunity and organizations aren't really designed well to actually combat the problem. Now, I do think some mindsets are starting to shift. I do see some organizations starting to think differently about how they run their cybersecurity programs. But, you know, in a lot of ways, the structural challenges that many, many organizations face, the government's a fantastic example of this problem, <laughs> right? Are, their, their, their structure is, gonna, is inherently causing them to fail. And they've got to rethink how they do security if they're going to be successful. It's not just a technology problem. It's absolutely, it's absolutely a structural people problem. Yeah. Can, or go ahead, sorry. And, and back to the, uh, this, that math thing, I think the, the answer, one answer to your question is, um, can you demonstrate, if you're one of these companies, leverage in the math problem, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what we have to have, we have to have leverage here, right? And so if you're a company and you come along and say, here's the thing I, like Mike said, I did this, you know, one thing to find the next thing. If the, if the outcome of that for companies is to say, here's another thing to buy, to put into the networks we all described, which were legacy in nature and are very complex already, you're not, you don't have a great future. Right? Because the complexity is the enemy of security. Right? So what has to happen is it has to get more elegant. I mean that in a technical term. Right? It has to be simpler. Simplicity is the friend of security. Right? So to get leverage over this, if you whatever that thing is, and you're seeing this play out in our industry today, um, that things that for a very long time were these, here you need this, and you need this, and you need this, and you need this, they're being subsumed in the platforms, like Mike said. And uh, because all, that's the only way you can get leverage over this. But if your pitch is going to be buy this thing from me so that you as a customer can put one more thing in your network, you know, from a security perspective, you probably don't have a bright future. Yeah, one, one of the things uh, to pick up on what Mark is saying that uh, I think we're all doing from a technology perspective is trying to get smarter to make sure that the products can talk to each other to help overcome the problem Chris talked about where the organizations don't. So how can we make what we do simpler for the folks in our security organizations who are monitoring the security environment. If the products can talk to each other, if they can correlate what they're seeing, they can be a lot more effective. And that's a trend you're starting to see a lot more in our industry. You know, um, Chris, you, I, I want to drill down on something you said there. You know, you said a lot of organizations, they're, they're reorganizing so they can more efficiently deal with these problems. But I'd, I'd like to give people a better picture. Like, so what does that look like, especially if you're not a ginormous company? So, um, so I sat down with the CISO for one of the names that got mentioned earlier in, the, in, in your opening. You know, they, and he kind of came in after the fact, which as many CISOs, like most of the CISOs of those companies are new now, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he, he came in after the fact. And... and you know, he's instituted in an entirely different way of operating a security program. Because what he told me is like, hey, when I came in, you know, there was security was distributed all throughout the different parts of the IT group. There were some kind of cybersecurity people, you know, under the CISO. But, you know, they, you know, they, they were constantly sort of in turf wars with different parts of the IT organization. 
And, and the other thing he said he did is he said, look, you know, we're not going to try to run this security infrastructure, but what we are going to do is we're going to create a whole new series of metrics. You know, things like how do we get medium time, median time to detection, median time to response. We're going to run like exercises every day so that we, when we know that threats are getting into our environment, we're going to measure ourselves on how fast we can detect those threats and actually respond to them. And we're going to build like Pareto charts and actually understand how far, how far down that curve we can go before we need to sort of rethink our approach. And like that's a completely different way of thinking about your security program than, okay, let me go buy a firewall. Let me go buy antivirus. Let me go buy this. Plug those things in. Hope that they work. And if they don't, then, you know, I get fired and somebody else gets the job. And actually, and anyone can chime in here. Do you think it's fair after there's a, there's a big breach, should the CISO get fired? I think it's complicated, right? Because I, I do. Cause, I, I don't presume to know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, fair, you know, in business, hard to say, right? It, I think it's complicated, though, because, you know, after a breach, to some degree, if, if the people who know the most about your organization basically have no incentive to stay or they get fired or whatever, you, know, you may be in a long, elongated period of cleaning up after that breach. So I think, there, I think that's a, a very interesting question from a managerial perspective is how do you hold people accountable, but also how do you make sure you can get your business back up and running quickly you know, without basically disincentivizing everybody in the security organization to go look for a new job? And by the way, they can get one tomorrow. Because there's so few people in this industry, they can get a new job tomorrow, even if they were in an organization that was the victim of a breach. And we will come back to that. But, Mike, you laughed at that question. What do you think? Uh, I think Chris is spot on. I mean, uh, the truth is, if there's a very sophisticated attacker, let's say it's state-sponsored, and they want to get into a company, much less a government, and we've already seen how our government's been breached multiple times, I think it's pretty hard to defend against that. So I'd find it very hard to hold the CISO accountable and say, we were breached, you're fired. I think uh, a lot of times boards, CEOs, are not very sophisticated in terms of the kind of metrics that they should be following uh, to really assess the question, are we safe? You know, the question you get asked, are we safe, could we be breached? Well, in some ways, that's kind of nonsense. I just said, if the attacker is motivated enough and you have it sophisticated <laughs> enough, they're going to get in. What kind of things should you be following? Chris was talking about that. Uh, how many endpoints are infected? Uh, what is our mean time to remediate a situation? We should have a series of metrics that we're following uh, to make sure that our organizations are as safe as they can be. How well are we protected? As we uh, put those in place, we're going to have a lot better sense of was the person not doing their job and should be fired, or this was a situation that had been very difficult to, uh, to protect against. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Yeah, we just, uh, I saw a statistic <laughs> recently that un until last, uh, last year, about a year ago, the shortest tenured job in a public company in the United States was the CEO. And now it's the <laughs> chief security officer. <laughs> Happy to change places, right? Sometimes they go out but, together, right? <laughs> well, I think what's, that's my point. What's, what's changed in all this is, you know, was it, whether the CISO is getting fired, was the CEO getting fired, right? You know, because if she is getting fired, the CISO is definitely getting fired. <laughs> right? so Coming that, with me. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So that's, that's a big shift. <laughs> and Ken, any other thoughts on that? Uh, I would say some of the, the bridge happened in, in, in all these well-known cases. Um, their security level actually above average. But what they got is really the, the spotlight effect. And uh, <clears throat> once you in, in the news, then they look at all the detail because uh, I have to say, a lot of time, even they are already pretty secure, but like uh, oh, Mike said, there, there's no 100% guarantee. And also a lot of time they just get too much information and a false alarm, whatever they cannot handle. Uh, like the biggest retail happened <clears throat> like two years ago, it's really they just get so many alarm information, and uh, it's all breach happening, whatever, like a few hundred a day. So they cannot deal with it anymore. Uh, so that's actually you need to have some, some help on the technology, not only detection, but also find a way to prevent it happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether you can like, automatically prevent things. Or, uh, that, that's where in security, you will see there's a few stage. Uh, like the, the new technology, always first stage, whether the intrusion or the sandbox or all this kind of ATP, the first stage always the detection. And then the second stage is really uh, you can reduce force, or, uh, force positive, then become the prevention, become an inline device, so take some action. 
And then the third stage is got become the integration. You need to integrate with other systems, whether the firewall, whatever, you can call UTM or NIGM firewall, that's become the, the intrusion technology integrate with the firewall, become a whole system there. And then eventually you also need to reduce the cost because the security is always a, a trade off how much risk you want to take and, uh, and what's the cost. So if you can do a security without cost a lot, without compromise your productivity, then that's better, more effective than, than the, the most costly is whether you have the air gap. You never connect things together, then you lost all the productivity. And then eventually it's really how you can fit in all the infrastructure because today's network is starting to get faster and faster. So security is still much more computing intensive, much slower compared to a lot of application. So that's making security become burden for a lot of company, whether the cost or, or kind of <clears throat> reduce the productivity or a lot of human involved. Uh, so that's where we try to see how to find the, the balance point with your cost, productivity, the risk you're willing to take. So that's the challenge for a lot of IT guys. Mm -hmm. Now, Ken and Mike, when we were, we were talking about this, you guys both mentioned, you know, what some call nation state hacking. And, you know, this isn't the kid in the basement. This is, you know, the Chinese army. This is Iran who, you know, pick your, your bad guy from a James Bond movie. Both of uh, those. <laughs> um, you know, to what extent, if I'm uh, a company, does it matter who did it or who's trying to do it? You know, there, there's sort of a debate in the security industry right now, like, well, you should just lock your stuff down and not be getting obsessed over, you know, who this is. And some people say it, it really helps you if you, can, if you know who's going after you. And I'd like to actually do a poll of the, of the panel here. It matters. Right. It matters. So if you, if it, the, the who is often associated with the why, and the why is going gonna, is gonna to tell you what they're looking for. I mean, so you can go through the, the questions, right, and you say, you know, you, 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 it matters. Now, at the end of the day, you know, Ken actually described an interesting maturity model for, you know, the, the, the defensive component of this. If you don't have all those things right, like the, the who doesn't really matter that much, I mean, to some degree. So it, it, your level of sophistication sort of dictates, I think, whether you really care about the who. But I do know a lot, a lot of, I, I challenge that with a lot of customers. And so I've debated this a, a bunch of different times. And, and I used to say, well, yeah, why, don't, why do you care about the who? And they say, well, the who dictates what information they might be looking for or what ultimately what aspect of my organization they might be going after. And if you're, let's say you're the CISO for a, you know, 300,000 person organization that operates in 90 countries around the world and you got massive amounts of infrastructure, like the who and the what matters a lot because you can't just, you know, generically defend everything the same way. So you, having some uh, understanding of who's coming at you, what they might be looking for, their level of motivation, it does matter. Yeah, I've got a little bit, I mean, a little bit of a different matter on it, which is, uh, I think it does matter that, um, and, and I agree with everything Chris said as to why, but the, you know, what are they after, and then what are the methods, right, that were used, and you can learn from the methods. Right. I do think it's something, though, it's, uh, that the security industry and, and all the customers took, like, in my opinion, a, sort of an unfortunate frolic and detour over the last, call it, three years in security on this point, and just got so obsessed uh -huh. with this, um, frankly, because it's like, one, it's intellectually curious. Of course, if you get robbed, you want to know, who did, if you, you know, if someone robbed us, you'd be like, who did that? Why would they do that to me, right? You know? And um, it's like, you got robbed, don't worry about it. So the, <laughs> you know, you know there, so there's an intellectual curiosity aspect of knowing, of, of knowing that, which, which has some bearing on things that could be better in the future, right? And then the second thing is, that's the James Bond part. Right, and everybody loves that stuff. Yeah, right. Like, in, including the media, which plays a big oh, role. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This, yeah. So the media ate it up, right? And then I, I don't know, like I say, for last, you know, for two or three years, and it's changing. I can see it changing. But the last two or three years, there's just such an obsession with this. Uh, meanwhile, you know, not taking care of business on other things that we've talked about. You have to do, but they just put time, tons of time and money. And I just think there's, there's way too much attention on that. Uh -huh. And you should you should garner the the right things out of that. The, what are they after, and how do they do it? But you know, move on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the method is important. Uh, we learn a lot by studying what attackers do, what's the kill chain. So if we understand that, uh, and it doesn't know it's apply, it probably applies more to uh, the criminals than it does the nation states, but if you learn how a certain ba bank is being attacked in one part of the world, you know, the criminals are trying to leverage their own business model, right? Uh, the more they can 
attack using the same technique, the better. That's cheaper. So back to the math problem that Mark talked about originally. Uh, they're trying to make the math work on their side. We've got to be smarter about seeing, okay, here's the method they're using, and we've got to spread that to all the customers as quickly as possible, because if they're using that technique for a bank in Australia, it's not going to be 10 minutes later that you're seeing that in the UK or here in the US. So I think the method is critically important in, in, in the WHO and how we prevent uh, more attacks from occurring. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I view there's uh, four kind of attack there. Uh, the traditionally we, we call activists. It's really the one they, they try to demonstrate hey, their work, they want to make some statement, and uh, they make famous there. Uh, so that's still there. And then there's a nation state. And then on the other side, there's also the criminal, like the, the Cripple Wall Street. Uh, so they can make a lot of money there behind. And then there's also the terrorist. But right now we see probably a lot of things starting to happen is really uh, the hacker said they become a business model there. So they can make a lot of money out of there. So that's just like the, the Crypto War 3. You can say in, in about one year, they made over 300 million, 325 million out of all this campaign there. So that's, they become a business model. The, the issue is really once they cross the border, you cannot do anything about it. Because the internet is a global sense. But when you do the law enforcement, you can only do local here. So that's making the sense, making attacking so easy, low cost, not much risk. And defense starting to get more, more, more kind of expensive or more, more difficult right now. Because even you found out the bad guy, you cannot do anything about it. Uh, so that's the whole internet structure right now. And if there's a way to really have more cooperation or there's a way to break down the criminal, that's maybe can make the attack cost higher, like Mark said. Because right now, they, they almost have no cost, no risk behind. Mm -hmm. So we just, you know, we talked about the very sexy part of security here, the, the James Bond aspect, the different types of hackers. Um, we're going to talk about something really boring now, but something maybe important. How much of this stuff uh, would be stopped or would be better if people just patched their systems? And I, I know we're in Silicon Valley, but just, you know, you get that annoying alert you know, every month or so saying, oh, there's a new version for Word or new Flash. iOS, a new Flash. And if people just like hit update right away every time, how much of this stuff would, would stop? A lot. <laughs> oh, surprising yeah. you would say yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, it's hygiene. It's hygiene. Like there's all sorts of things that yeah. you should just do, and that's one of them of patching your system so you're always most up to date because the providers are trying to fix known vulnerabilities all the time, yeah. and that's why they're that's why they're pushing it, the yeah. update, right? That's where the, everybody probably knows that that's where that concept of zero day comes in. What are the vulnerabilities that exist and uh, how do you stop that as soon as possible? And a lot of times a long time exists when these zero day vulnerabilities occur before there's a patch in the market. And all that time, people are out there taking advantage of those holes. Uh -huh. Would you guys, I mean, um, especially, you know, being in charge of such a, a large like antivirus engine, you know, could you put a number even on like how much of the activity you're seeing is from old bugs that you know had been fixed long ago well if you if you <clears throat> if you think about the breaches a lot of the the highest profile breaches you know where there's there's publicly available information or i don't know of a single one that there wasn't actually some vulnerability that was exploited as part of the breach at yeah. somewhere in the chain right whether that was an unpatched system a misconfigured router a you know a, a sysadmin credential that was you know admin one, two, three, you know, or, or no password whatsoever. So, you know, those are just basic, you know, hygiene, you know, that basic hygiene components of running an IT infrastructure that um, time and time again, a vendor wasn't properly uh, configured. Somebody wasn't running anti-malware on one of their systems. I mean, you can tick down the list, but I can go find you that in almost every single major breach that we've seen in the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. But also, with uh, so many things or device connected to the internet, the things got worse and worse because a lot of them designed without security in mind because they have very limited computing power mm -hmm. and also uh, uh, with a very new uh, application of OS. Uh, so that's where we estimate the, the, the IoT, the Internet of Things, is a 10 to 100 times less secure than the PC or some other mature, mature OS. Uh, because uh, uh, it's a very limited uh, and uh, both the time to prove and secure and also uh, limited computing power, you can do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, with the exception, and if I get 
bios here wrong, please forgive me. With the exception of Ken, the three of you started in other parts of tech before coming into security, right? Or so true for me. Yeah. yeah. More or less, Chris, somewhere in between. More or less security for me. Oh, okay, all right. So one of the issues, and Chris, you and I talked about this a little bit beforehand, one of the issues in security right now, there just aren't enough security professionals, whether it's uh, in the government, in the private sector. Um, and I guess for me, you know, what's been the challenge and how do we fix it of getting more people to come into this space? I think we got to do a couple things. And this, and this is something that it just... It, you know, even at a at a national level, we just we just we need this to happen. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think there's a couple things that need to happen. One is the people who are actually going into technical professions. We need to we need to get more of them, you know, interested in security. You know, one of the things that that you know we like we're Intel's got a big diversity initiative, and so I was just recently with uh, one of the girls who code groups, and my whole pitch to the 30 women in the room was, you need to think about. I, I'm glad you code, but I want you thinking about cybersecurity as mm -hmm. as as a, uh, an element of what you might do in your career. I, I think that, that we're gonna have to go at this almost at like a, a programmatic level where the government invests in something like a cyber core, you know, where we're really getting into maybe people coming out of high school, certainly college age. You know, I'm thinking almost you know, similar, you look at the Israeli military, you know, a lot of the best, you know, many of the, the best Israeli companies are from men and women who were trained in the military. Many of them never even went to college, right? They just went up through the military, special defense forces, have started many of the elite. You know, Mark knows some of them very, very well. Uh, Ken, <laughs> I mean, you know, so it, it's, I, th I think that is an incredible training ground. Um, and, and certainly the magnet, the scale of, 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 of professionals that we need to come into the business is something that is going to require a governmental sort of investment in order for us to really get to where we want to be. Yeah, or you know, incentive programs along those lines. If you go to, uh, um, I agree with Chris, if you go to Singapore, for example, different system. Uh -huh. you know, the Singaporeans, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, they just said Singapore will be the cybersecurity hub for uh, Asia Pacific, uh, if not the world. And they are on a crash course with exactly the kind of stuff that Chris is talking about with um, institutes p taking people out of the military, doing it. They're, they're, they intend to produce lots of these uh, professionals. We have a different system, you know, in the United States, right? So I think our, our ability to do what Chris is talking about has to be from an incentive perspective from governments uh, as well. Um, and then also um, you can see it happening right now in our, our college and university systems, right? So there are a lot of uh, universities right now, community colleges that are, have stood up cybersecurity courses to get certificates of cybersecurity to, you know, to get a degree in cybersecurity. Our military now has a U.S. Cyber Command, um, so in branches, like you used to go into the infantry or the armor, the field artillery or aviation, now there's one called the Cyber, um, so that it's happening. Um, it, and I completely agree with Chris, if it doesn't happen at a very fast rate, we'll just be underwater from a, you know, a manpower perspective and all this. Back to the math problem. Okay. <laughs> The Im impact, uh, you can see, is definitely there. I saw a report today that said there was the impact of cyber crimes, $3 trillion worldwide. So it's a massive problem that certainly justifies uh, some of what, uh, what Chris and Mark were talking about. And it's a shame to see other countries. India is another one that's got an initiative to train lots and lots more folks in cyber. So it's a shame to see that the U.S. isn't on the forefront of that. Yeah, also, I think not only I agree all of that are saying we need to have more training working with all the university, high school, but also uh, if you look at right now, the, the cybersecurity or internet security, uh, even some engineer side, they're not quite uh, uh, like in a system as, as lawyer, right? So you have a lawyer, you have a CPA, and uh, that's where, but somehow in the cybersecurity, uh, you don't have that kind of sense, right? So, yeah. so that's where somehow it's very difficult to judge who is really good, goes through the formal training, and there's some system or standard you can meet. Uh, they do have some, some other, a lot of third party like CISP, some other things, but not quite in the, the whole education system, like how we train the, the finance professional. They have yeah. all the CPA, all the things, and they have how they train a the lawyer. Uh, even the MBA, there's a, quite some program there. But nothing in the in the whether the some engineer or even cybersecurity space. Well, and that gets to another thing I wanted to ask because you know we can say we need more people, but you know 
I'm obviously not a technical person. That's why I'm on this end of the stage. Um, is security just like a harder part of tech than say, I want to make the next Instagram or the next you know, app? Uh, security <laughs> changing very quick, just like a lot of computer or whatever. That's where after you go through the college four years, half the things you learned is no longer useful. So security is similar <laughs> things, right? So every year there's so many things changing there. Uh, but on the other side, it's a lot of traditional things still apply. So a lot of basic methodology is still useful. Uh, but once they have a better system, I feel more people will be getting here, get trained, and reach a certain level. Otherwise, right now, it's very difficult to judge. Uh, like uh, Mike said in the early days, really, in the, in the, in the healthcare industry, in some other things, a little bit also in the security space, really, there's a, so many hype going on right now. I would say you can see southern startup uh, happening in the, in the over 1,000 in the last two years. And every company, they just try to promote, in, hey, we have the best product, most secure product. So how to judge that is very difficult for a lot of IT buyer because they have a very hard time to test themselves what is secure, what is not secure, and how good for, for all these things working together. Uh, that's where if there's a way to really validate whether some third party, uh, in the healthcare industry, uh, there's a FDA, they do certain testing, certain things. I, I'm not sure the security should go to the government, but at least some other validation of whether you can judge in the, the product or the people, that's what help in the whole industry. Okay. Um, you know, as uh, was said in the introduction, you guys are all part of an organization where you're sharing information on the types of you know, bad things you're seeing out there. Uh, the U.S. Senate or uh, passed this week a bill that would uh, you know, sort of allow people across the country and in various industries to do things like this. Uh, it is colloquially referred to as CISA. Um, what do you guys think of this? I mean, this is the first time um, we've had you know, a high profile bill like this that could actually you know, become law. I think there's, there's uh, back to getting to, to leverage and all this, three things have to happen. One we talked to quite a bit about, which is from a technology perspective, technology has to change into next generation capabilities. Mm -hmm. Talked about that. The second one we just talked about for a while was uh, called the personal cyber hygiene. Mm -hmm. Train people not to do um, things that you obviously not do and protect themselves and data. And this is the third one to get leverage. So it's technology. Um, training and then the third is sharing right? and um, you have to create an environment that is one where that from a uh, from an automated perspective we can actually share threat intelligence information in a highly automated fashion and as faster that that can occur without violating privacy issues right and we're gonna the get to faster that. that can occur the more leverage uh, will be put into this uh, situation because then it's not just your company versus the bad guys and I'm doing my own thing versus the bad guys and it's leveraging all of these networks um, in a way um, that we can we can really move the ball down the field so from a legislative perspective there has to be certain things that, that uh, occur there mm -hmm. some have occurred there's um, it is you know the, it is not an antitrust violation in the United States today by fiat that was the DOJ uh, yeah, was guidance the, yeah, yeah like about 18 months ago you know for for sharing to occur that's de facto not a an antitrust violation that's that's may sound like a little thing but that's good to do right you know okay so now there's other things as well as to what are the liability protections you know we you don't want to um, um, immunize negligence here or trample on privacy rights but um, you know getting that balance right is going to be very important because it's because until there's certainty around that some legal certainty around that the ability to do that highly automated share is just not going to happen because people are not going to you know uh, potentially cross a line that they're going to be uh, um, you know have a problem for so it's, it's important I mean in some ways that's why we're all here uh, today what brought us all is the formation of the cyber threat alliance we're an experiment really of can competitors start to share more information and can we uh, create a safer outcome as a result and we've got our first uh, proof of that uh, with what Ken referred to earlier as crypto wallet I don't know many people are familiar with that but it, it's a type of ransomware the bad guys uh, basically encrypt the data on your machine and say unless you pay 500 bucks your data is lost so we as a group went after can we share information together and catch some group of this uh, of these criminals in the act so this is an experiment the cyber threat alliance can we share can we do more good by working together which is what mark just said yeah to some degree the the voluntary aspect of what we're doing allows us to be more nimble uh -huh. um you know this you know, CISA's been in the works for 
years. Some right? have called it the zombie bill. Yeah, so you know that <laughs> the speed is like you've kind of heard that I think probably a lot of times now tonight. You know, speed is of the essence in this situation. Um, that's why I like more voluntary, um, you know, collaboration like what we're doing. But we also like as we've spent time together, we've we've said let's get targeted and focused on some areas where we think we can make a difference. That's why we went after ransomware as a category, mm -hmm. and and it did produce the results, or even better, I think, than we might have thought going into it. And so, I think we're a good example of ways ways in which if we collaborate around certain problems, we can actually we can get some results that are that are unique, but also allow us to contribute in, in different ways, given that we have slightly different aims as our as different companies. Yeah. And because each of our company cover a little bit different area, there's some overlap, but it's really uh, uh, working together and share information, right? It really helping uh, to have a better protection. And like when we started this uh, alliance uh, a little bit over one year ago, we say, hey, maybe let's share 1,000 malware sample every day. And uh, later we found, hey, that's probably not enough. And how we can do a better job. And uh, that's where we identified this ransomware a few months ago. Let's say, hey, let's try to target, let's try to see how we can bring down some of the, the big uh, criminal world behind. And uh, that, that's the result of working together, share some information so we can identify uh, the, the whole, whole system behind. And uh, so there's a, like 800 they call the C2, the command and control website. Mm -hmm. And there's also like, a, a, like a, even in the first month, we, we will be able to, to, to like a prevent, like a, there's a few hundred million attempt uh, to get in there. So, so there's a lot of, a, like a, since after we share, we see the whole picture better. Uh, so that's making the, the defense more effective. Mm -hmm. I got a couple more questions and then I, I wanna throw it open to you folks. So you know, start thinking about those, and I think there's, there'll be mics coming around. Um, but, you know, Chris and Mark, you guys talked about, you know, you guys are doing some of this information sharing um, voluntarily anyway. You know, then I guess why, why would legislation like this be needed? Like, what does it, what does it make easier? Uh, primarily liability. Yeah. Right, if you get it right, right, it's a liability protection to say if you're sharing things and you've done it in a, in accordance with the legislation and with now malfeasance or attempts to do anything you know that's nefarious along those lines, um, so everything's above board, um, then or can you be protected for any yeah. outcomes that would occur? Like if something were untoward to happen, um, if you have wide open liability for that occurring, you're less likely to want to share, right? So again, like I said, you can't, you know, you don't, don't want to immunize the negligence. So, but if you if you cross that bar, right, um, then hopefully you can get some kind of a liability protection for sharing, so that you you're encouraged to, to do that, or at least not discouraged, you know, from uh -huh. doing it. And you mentioned the privacy concerns. Um, so, folks, um, for those who haven't been following every step of Washington minutia, um, some have been concerned that you know. When security companies such as yourselves are allowed to share information about threats they're seeing with the government, you know this uh, exposes consumers to various uh, privacy violations or what some would call privacy violations. Um, I mean, this gets thrown a lot around a lot with this bill, and I'd be curious for your guys' take. Like, is this something we should be worried about? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I agree. So, yeah. Completely agree. Yeah. And, and so, what in the, what in the bill needs to change then for that not to be? Well, my understanding is, uh, the, the, without being intimate in all the minutiae as you had described, that, uh, what, the way this bill works is uh, when we share with the government, and it starts with the Department of Homeland Security, then they do a broad sharing with everyone, including the NSA. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, is that the right way it should be shared? What protections should there be for personal information uh, that gets shared with broadly across the government? Uh -huh. um, so as it stands now, I mean, would you be comfortable sharing with the government some of this data? Well, we you don't have to. Right? We uh, we do share, yeah. and I'm sure yeah. we all share some information with the government. But we, when we do share, we make sure that personally identifiable information is not part of that. And typically, you don't need to share that kind of information to stop the attackers to uh, share information about what methods attackers are using and so forth. So I think we just, as a society, want to be clear that how this information can be shared, what can be shared, and what protections there are. Uh huh. I think uh, sharing. This entire information definitely helped, it's, it's good. But I feel that's also not quite enough because uh, there's just too much information. 
uh -huh. and a lot of IT security guys, they, they just get so, so much information, they have a difficult time to see hey, what, what's the true, what's the false, all these kind of things. I feel if there's a way to help them, uh, just like in the, in the healthcare industry, there's a, some, 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 some system can help them make a better decision uh, whether judging the information on the product will, will, be, will, will be much better because uh, uh, today there's just, just uh, so many information and uh, false alarm happening in the space. Even, even from the vendor side, we see a lot of uh, 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 some company, whether it's startups, I'm saying, uh, they also marketing a lot, right? So, so that, that's making uh, uh, some kind of IT guys starting to get confused uh, because for them, they are very difficult to do the testing themselves uh, because security is too complicated, whether they're in the technical level or they don't have the resource. Uh, so that's where, if there's a, something beyond sharing gathering information, also can help them uh, make their decision uh, just like happened in the, in, in the healthcare industry so they can help them make some better judgment and making the, uh, the Difficulty of making decision lower because right now f for the individual or, or the uh, whether in the in the IT IT industry, uh, IT professional or the consumer, uh, pretty much impossible for them to making some some judgment testing themselves. Uh -huh. So they, they really need to depend on some whether the third party or government, just like they happen in the healthcare industry, the FDA, uh, to help them in the next level uh, how they can make things better. Um, can, I, can I add one, one thing? So I, I think that, that I think that we don't we don't we aren't going to know all these. We're not going to know where we're going to potentially intrude on privacy, you know, a priori. Like I, I think what my recommendation on the bill to the government would be: Look, you need to create you need to create a framework where we can actually do some experimentation, like we're doing with CTA. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of learn as we go. I mean, this, 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 the attack landscape is moving so quickly. How can we possibly take a monolithic approach, like, a, like legislation coming out of Congress, and expect that we're going to be able to, to be as nimble as our adversary? Just it, we, we have to think, rethink the construct, because here we go again. Like, let's apply the, the way we've been doing things for like 300 years to a problem mm -hmm. that's changing every minute. It just, it's not, it, it's just, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And I, I applaud the, 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 the intent, but the structure is going to be its downfall if we, if we just kind of do it the way we've always done it. Are you suggesting Washington is being clunky and slow-footed? <laughs> There's your headline right there. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, sure, Chris. <laughs> we certainly hope Washington stays focused on catching the bad guys. That's clearly one of government's That's roles. Right. Yeah. So. We're all supportive of that. All right, I think we have time for one more, um, and this is sort of a, a broad question about the change in tech. You guys have all been in uh, the technology space for quite a while. In that time, we've seen enterprise tech go from, you know, you have a bunch of servers in the back room and you keep all your stuff there. So now, you know, even the Wall Street Journal, we are now switching uh, to email from a company that rhymes with uh, Google. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I can't say Google. Um, so anyway, you know, is this making us safer? The idea that we are sort of, you know, outsourcing, you know, email is no longer an Outlook server in the back. You know, we use Slack, um, you use Gmail, you use AWS, you use Dropbox. Um, does this make our corporate data safer, or be sort of, is that a risk? No, it doesn't make it safer. Uh, mm -hmm. Estimates are that as people move to the cloud, you expand the attack surface by four to ten times. So, all of the things that we love about technology that improve our own productivity come with security risks. So as already been mentioned, a lot of these things are not designed with security mm -hmm. in mind. So if uh, companies providing cloud-based services do think about security and provide that, then you can be safer. Uh -huh. But without uh, really thinking about that proactively, you're not safer. I think you gotta know safer than what, right? I mean, <laughs> that, you know, that, that's the, true. the hard part is like, what's the baseline? I mean. Mike opened up and said, you know, like the question you asked is kind of like asking why do people get sick? Like it, to yeah. some degree, you, you know, we need to, you need to understand the baseline to be able to say this is safer than that because it, it, it depends on the business. It depends on, you know, what's in that email system. It depends on 
what email system you're comparing it against. I think it has potential to be safer in some use cases. I think that that's absolutely true. I think in other ones, as Mike pointed out, you know, you open up the attack surface because of ways in which you're doing things differently. I think what's more fundamental about the cloud, if you're, if you're, a, an, if you're an organization, an enterprise, what's more fundamental from a security perspective about the cloud is that you're now outsourcing your security to somebody else mm -hmm. with very little ability to actually say anything or do anything about it if something goes wrong. So that's the question, that's probably your first question you gotta ask yourself is, well, how do I manage my, because I'm still responsible, but now I've asked some, I've given, I've given over you know, the control to somebody else. And I think that's a more fundamental question than whether I'm safer or not. And I, I guess, and in, in, in you, you raise a good point, Chris, that, that question was kind of vague. When you're dealing with clients and they're saying, oh, you know, we're no longer storing that, we're now gonna use cloud provider X, yeah. um, do you generally find those providers are taking you know, their customer security seriously? Do you trust those, those providers? I think, well, see, and they're all, they're different, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, is it a, a platform provider? Uh -huh. Like, cause a platform provider is kind of like, you know, it's kind of like buying a server, right? If, yeah. if, if you want to layer in all the security technologies and, and bring your own policies, it, it's, it's pretty much an open environment and it's up to you to construct your security controls if you go into most kind of hosting or cloud platform providers. If you go into a SaaS provider, then they do theoretically bring some security controls, but then you're back into that world where you've effectively now outsourced mm -hmm. the responsibility to somebody else. So SaaS you know, so versus public cloud, private, so like it's, cloud is sort of, unfortunately it's like it means different things depending upon how you're consuming the technology, how it's deployed, what you're actually buying. Uh, so that's the that's the challenge. It's it's, it's a pretty complex issue, and I think uh, there's going to be there's you should start with those bigger questions first if if you're thinking about moving to, to more from a traditional environment to the here's, cloud. Here's the use case that uh, I'm worried about that uh, I hear many of our customers worried about is great. You've moved your email to the cloud, or you've moved maybe Salesforce or other uh, even more sensitive information to the cloud, even even more than your email. And now you have employees who are using that at Starbucks mm -hmm. over Wi-Fi, and they're downloading information to their own personal device and taking that away, and then you have a lot bigger security risk, certainly, than what you had protecting a corporate network. You basically lost control of what applications they were using, what data. Now, we have technologies that can protect uh, you in that vulnerable situation, but it's not the same technologies that you'd use to protect a corporate network. I feel it's really a case-by-case -case analysis. It's always a, a balance point because uh, if you see when data move to the cloud compared you can lock in your server room, uh, if you handle the same way for security, it definitely will be less secure. But if there's some cloud provider, they're much more professional or they have a bigger skill, whatever, more, more protection, mm -hmm. that can make it a little bit secure. So that's always the, how the balance point among handle something uh, with some big scale, whatever, more complicated solution compared to you handle something yourself. It's really the balance among how much scale you have, the resource level, and also ease of use. Uh, I also with, uh, agree with Mike, really when you move a lot of things into the mobile device, that also makes things much less secure compared to the traditional way you handle that. Uh, but then you also need to work in with the carrier, some other service provider, try to make the pipe a little bit more clean, we call it a clean pipe. Uh, so there's a different way to address the issue. It's really more case by case. It's very difficult to say, move to the cloud will be more secure, or you keep in, in your own enterprise will be more secure. It, it, it's, it's, it's the cost issue, the scale issue, and also what you compromise if you move some things there. Mm -hmm. um, we are going, are, are the microphones out? I'm just gonna open this up to, oh, we got one in the back there. Um, and guys, thank you so much. And thank you. I'm sure we'll. Next question. Okay. So, my name is Dominique Trampant. Uh, when I listen to you, I have a vocabulary question. Um, you seem to be very focused on intrusion protection. What about extrusion protection? Um, we, uh, I'm on the board of a small company, a clean tech company that is very successful, and uh, we found a Chinese truck in the parking lot trying to suck our R&D data, um, and 
we were scrambling to figure out how to detect that they took anything. Uh, so that's kind of question number one. Question number two in the vocabulary section is that you talk a lot about defense uh, and um, uh, and my question is, what about offense? Why don't we destroy the destroyers? And it's a bit of an inf informed question because I, I know actually of a company in Israel who tried to do that by uh, former Mossad agents. And uh, they existed, I think, for three or four days. And uh, <laughs> the, the Russian mafia threatened them to say, we know where your kids are going to school, we, we, are gonna, we know where your grandmother is, and we are going to take them down if you don't shut down the company. The, the company was shut down. But I'm kind of wondering at the industry level if we, we don't have weaponry that we could deploy against the hackers. Well, I want to take the easy part of the question, which is the <laughs> exfiltration of, of key data. Uh, frankly, uh, there are technologies that what we call help you make sure the good stuff stays in. So we all produce technologies that keep bad guys out. But what about the most critical data? If you're a software company, it's a s source code. Uh, but maybe it's uh, your credit card information if you're a retailer and so forth. So the technology exists. It's called data loss prevention, that you can p apply some policies to make sure some data never leaves, can't be accessed, who can access it, what are the conditions? So that technology exists. I'll jump on the, uh, I used to work for Dominique, uh, he taught me many of the things I know, so thank you. Uh, I think on the uh, offensive side, um, I personally think it's a very bad idea. And uh, the reason for that is not that the capabilities don't exist, um, but that you, if you just think about how easy it is for an attacker to fool uh, folks today about where an attack's coming from in the first place, now imagine that private companies were, um, were on the offense, right? And how easy it would be to be attacking the wrong thing, right? And so now we talked a little bit about liability before just in sharing information. Imagine that situation where you get it wrong, you know, and I think I was attacked by, uh, you know, by Chinese and I take Mike down as a result because they just redirected that attack or somehow, right? Oops, sorry about that. I was really, you know. Um, <laughs> It would just be such the Wild West situation. I do believe that there's a, absolutely a role to play from a government perspective. Isn't it illegal to, also? No, it is. I'm just yeah. saying so. But the question yeah, is... That's that's a minor point. point. That's not the important point. But from a government perspective, we do play, you know, we do play offense today, I think, uh, pretty, command, actually pretty, pretty, pretty well, right? Yeah. You know, so, and I think that's a role for them to play, and there's a place for that. But from a commercial private industry perspective, I just think that would be a, a Wild West situation. probably wouldn't end very well. But. Yeah, I'm not saying it shouldn't occur. I think the proper, the proper place is not, not like that company. I, I heard that story too, you know, but not like the company Israel. But um, if we all started to play offense, it'd be pretty messy pretty fast. You know. I think uh, maybe it's more uh, because internet is really connect globally together. And, uh, and then once you try to enforce uh, certain law cross border, it's almost impossible. And uh, that's where we found hackers sometimes, even they want to attack their next door, they just go overseas and then come back in, which you cannot trace them anymore. So that's where the problem is that the current internet architecture, really, they only address the connection. They never address what's in the user, what's in the application, what's in the content. I think to solve this issue, eventually you need to work in with whether the legal system or the different nation, whatever, just like in the, in, the, in the environment issue, just like a nuclear issue. So there have to be some cooperation to address the issue. Otherwise, you can hide behind. There's always famous really, when you connect internet, you never know what's behind there, whether it's a dog or whatever since connect with you. So that's the problem with today's internet architecture. And uh, on the other side, whether you want offense or not, I think from outside we say, let's just do the best defense. Uh, we say defense is already very, very difficult compared to offense. And that's where you need to defense millions of ways they want to attack you. Uh, offense is much more easy, and, uh, but to do the best defense, we have to work in together. So that's the reason we try to share information, cooperate, and we try to bring down this ransomware. Uh, because defense is much, much more difficult, much high cost compared to offense. Here's one thing I will say, though. <clears throat> you can... An organization can go more on offense inside its own entity. 
So one thing that, if you think about it, a lot of times in a cybersecurity paradigm, the defenders actually kind of wait for something to happen. Then they, 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 you know, a piece of malware comes in. They either try to block it or they try to fix it, clean it. But they, they wait for an alert to happen before they do anything. You know, one thing that I'm starting to hear more and more, and I think this is actually a really good methodology, the most proactive security organizations are saying, I'm going to, like, let my security apparatus deal with the 99% of threats I care about. I'm going to go literally hunting in my environment for the threats that might not actually be active. They could be dormant. They could be periodically active. But I'm going to proactively go out and find those threats and not wait for an alert to come through my, you know, my IPS or my firewall or my SIM tool to, to let, before I start looking for that threat. So I do think there's an element of offensive or maybe sort of a proactive defense that I think a lot of organizations can, can use. And I, I think that's like the people who are out on the cutting edge right now, that's the kind of thing they're doing. So to build on Chris's point, uh, it's estimated that 70% of the attacks are unknown. So you don't know that an attack is occurring. And the average attack is over 200 days. So imagine that attackers in your environment, to Chris's point, almost a year, you don't even know it. So if we don't get more proactive and go hunting for these things, more uh, bad things will happen. Next question. Larry Magid, with, Larry Magid with CBS News. I wonder if you guys could comment about the tension between law enforcement slash government and the world of security and privacy. Uh, for example, a lot of people in your industry recommend strong encryption, but we had the FBI director recently question whether encryption was interfering with our ability to protect national security, to investigate crimes, et cetera. Um, so this is, I know, an always an ongoing debate, but I'm just curious, you know, where you guys feel, feel about this. I, I, I'll, I'll go live first. The, um, I think um, if historically um, the concepts of security and privacy, the, first of all, this is not a new debate. Let's start with that, right? And historically, and I mean for a long time, right, they've been in tension with each other and they move depending on what's happening, um, you know, where we are in history as a country and to sometimes more heavy on the security side, sometimes more heavy on the privacy side, and always attempting to find the perfect balance between the two. And it's very rare that that would occur, right? Um, but the important point of that is, is security and privacy. And a lot of times that debate, depending on where we are historically, gets security or privacy, right? And uh, my, my opinion is that they, it's a, that it has to be an and in there, not an or. I'm arguing that, that, that there's a tension between security and privacy versus law enforcement. I'm putting yep. security and privacy in the same bucket. Uh, because encryption, for example, gives you both security and privacy. Yeah. Yet yeah. there are those in law enforcement who feel that it's a threat to national security. To national security, which right? I guess right. is different than other kinds of security. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, I understand. What I'm saying is, is that is from a historical perspective, technologies change over time. But the tension between that situation this is not the first time it's ever occurred, right? The the technology we're talking about now is encryption called, you know, can you encrypt everything? And um, and if if so, is there a way to break it? If there's not a way to break it, should there be back doors in it, right, so that law enforcement can do that? And that's the debate that's, that's happening right now, and there's, uh, there's an obvious uh, tension. Both, both sides have a really good point, right, about privacy, and the other and law enforcement side has a really good point about, hey, if we, what if we can't get to the bad guy, right, because we can't read this stuff? And that has to get s sorted out, um, some, that, exactly how that's going to occur. I'm not really sure, but both, both sides have their back up pretty high on this. And, then, and until dialogue is occurring and starting to, to, do, uh, to occur now, um, it, I think it'll get worked out over time because historically it, it always has, right? What we have here is a new technical aspect called, for the time being, unbreakable encryption, right? Seeing as uh, uh, the privacy and the government, that's the lawyer's question. So you answered quite well. Uh, for, the, um, <laughs> <laughs> for the encryption, that's the technology not only used to protect, but also you see the Crypto War 3, they also use the technology to encrypt your data asking for money. So it depends on who is using the technology to do what. You can, you can protect your own data, but if some bad guy got your data encrypted, that's also a big trouble there. Uh, next question. One million by one million. On the One Million by One Million blog, we run uh, several major uh, thought leadership series, and one of them is thought leaders in cybersecurity, another one is thought leaders in Internet of Things. 
Now, we have a lot of conversations that are pointing to the fact that one of the reasons Internet of Things is not moving very fast is because cybersecurity is a threat. So a lot of CEOs, especially more, more and more now because of the breaches that are happening, are afraid that the more they increase the surface area, that opens up risks for threat, uh, risks for security breaches, are going to hinder Internet of Things. What's your perspective? What are you seeing? How do we get past this obstacle? I don't, I don't see Internet of Things moving slow. I'm not really sure about that. <laughs> um, I, we're connecting, I mean, we're connecting more devices, experiences than we ever have. I mean, the, the, the pace of change in technology is moving. I'll like, give you a clear example of where Internet of Things is moving slow. It's in retail. In, in retail. Yes. So if you, if you think about it, now you pretty much every retail experience, mobile devices, you know, smart mirrors, uh, you know, you can literally people walking around stores. I'm not sure that it's moving slow. We could debate whether things are moving quickly or moving slowly. I'm talking to customers every day. If you think about it, like the Internet of Things is actually happening, and a lot of us don't even know it. Think about it this way. We used to think about computing. Now we compute without thinking. It's happening all the time. So like most of the cars we drive, you know, one of the reasons everybody was so like up in arms about the, the Jeep hack that was in Wired magazine was that like most people don't even real, really realize that their car today is as much a computing device as it is a transportation device. So I actually think the Internet of Things is happening and, and the security problem is actually kind of trying to run, along, like, like we're trying to run behind it to catch up. Now, that being said, the one of, in my mind, one of the more profound aspects of connected devices or experiences is the crossover point for physical security implications, right? Where we used to just worry about data breaches, and now we should be thinking about, hey, I'm driving now, I'm gonna get in my car now and drive out of here at 70 miles per hour down the highway, maybe faster if I don't think there are any cops around. And if somebody were to actually attack my vehicle, they could kill me. That's a very real risk that we're starting to face because of connected, and you could apply that to the power grid, you could apply it to most industrial systems, all of which are being connected, many of which are unpatched systems. So I think that's gonna be a profound risk, but I don't feel like it's really holding anybody back that much. I think it's happening very quickly. Um, and, and you know, one good example is, one good example, like our Internet of Things business at Intel is growing double digits, right? It's like one of the fastest growing parts of our company. It, it's, this is happening. I, I think it's a big issue. We, get, we need to spend time on it. Um, it's, we've actually put some initiatives in place ourselves. We, we actually crafted an automotive security review board. Um, we're actually pouring a lot of resource into looking at how we can actually help with this problem because uh, the security models haven't kept up with a lot of the, the, the devices that we're starting to connect. It certainly complicates things. We talked about, uh, you know, networks disappearing into the cloud. Uh, you know, we, so when SaaS computing came along, applications left the network. Then mobility came along, and the users left the, left the network. And then cloud came along, and the network left the network, right? <laughs> and now we're going to have 500 billion more things, you know, connected. So it certainly complicates it. But I think kind of what, what Chris is saying is, as that occurs, at whatever pace it occurs, um, it's about the data. Like, what's the... In from a security perspective, how much intensity do you want to put from security on the data, right? So if the Chinese know that my I'm out of milk because my refrigerator told me that, they can have that, right? But if they're gonna, <laughs> you know, if it's my car's at risk, yeah, and I really care about that. So I think it'll be, I think it'll be a, you know, da a data-driven uh, as to how much intensity of security will matter in certain areas of IoT, and then there'll be requirements on that for automobiles, for example, and SCADA systems and airlines and things along those lines, probably not for Fitbit, right? Uh, you know, but it's, it, you have to go on a case-by-case -case basis. It's just very early on. It's, it's not even the first inning of Internet of Things, so it's an incredible opportunity, and I think we are behind as an industry, but we're going to catch up quickly because the threats are going to be there. That's what's being written about. Uh, that makes people's awareness higher, and we're going to be jumping all over that. Yeah, because... Uh, when you connect this together, people feel, hey, that does increase the productivity. Uh, just like you mentioned retail, you can see how Amazon, how some other eBay, all these uh, <clears throat> business starting to get more productive. Uh, but on the other side, uh, the trade-off is always when you become more productive, then, then what's the other you sacrifice, you, you compromise. 
And uh, you, we can all go back to the paper stage. We can, uh, like, uh, even today's military network still physically air-gapped. That's no physical connection. So that's making things not more productive. But on the other side, you get a traditional security there. Uh, so that's always a trade-off. I, I kind of agree. Uh, when you, like, get connection into a certain level, uh, you need to consider what's the the improvement of the productivity compared to what the other cost may come up. Uh, so that's where always you try to uh, uh, whether have a better system design or have some people more trained to handle this. Because I would say today's internet and also today's networking, whether routing switching, is only about connection. So if there's a way they can identify the user, they can identify the application, identify the content, especially inside the company, and that's what makes things better and making the, the, the improvement go to the next stage. Uh, because today, you, you do have supposed to be like 40, 50 years ago, you, know, you have a trust party, uh, connect together over internet. But once you connect all the other things, car, whatever, all together, and especially when you do the global connection, uh, you may have a business model, much bigger, better, whatever. But on the other side, it's a lot of a data right now is you just connect it together no longer enough. You need to see the content application the user behind. All right. Uh, next question, and we got time for one more after that. Hi, guys. My name's Will Glazier. I just have a quick follow-up back to that CISA bill, your favorite topic, I'm sure. Um, how, do you, how are you going to prevent information sharing from becoming a one-way street sort of from you guys into the government? And do you intend to use your leverage as some of the industry leaders to actually get info back, you know, to help you do your jobs? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I would say I think it's actually, um, in, in most cases, when I'm speaking to various government leaders, um, there's a desire for it to be a two-way street. Um, and there's, there's progress, and it's slow and clunky, or whatever the right words were right earlier, but on this. Uh, so um, in the last, you know, 12, 18 months or so, the, um, you know, the administration set up something called the, uh, the CTIC, which was the mechanism by which government organizations would share with themselves. Start with that, right? Because <laughs> that's not all happening, right? Um, also a, a way that um, every organization doesn't get the final say in what's classified, which is a huge problem here, by the way, because anything that's classified can't be shared. And of course, everybody classifies everything. So how does that get fixed? Um, and then another entity called the NKIC, which is supposed to be the mechanism through which industry will share to government and vice versa. So there's, there's progress being, being made in this front, but ultimately I'm, pr I'm, pretty, uh, I'm pretty sure it will be a, a two-way street for, um, you know, for unclassified uh, information. All right, next question, and this is unfortunately the last one. Hey there, my name's Anson. Uh, I have a question for you guys, which is, uh, we know that there are thousands of companies that are out there that are trying to disrupt the space. And we know that cybersecurity changes every two or three years and there's a slight quantum leap that happens, like Palo Alto coming out for firewalls, for application firewalls. Uh, what do you fear most that's gonna disrupt your space? Uh, or do you see some type of technology that you, you think is really out there and maybe you can describe that? <laughs> Look, I mean, we, we <laughs> predict your own decline. Yeah. <laughs> Publicly. Publicly, uh, yeah. Our industry is built on innovation. I mean, I, I don't fear it. Like, I don't fear innovation happening in our industry. I think it's something that you just, it's why, it, in some ways, it's, I think it's what I love about being in technology. And in, like, it's why I actually moved out to California five years ago so I could be part of this ecosystem. So in my mind, like, I don't fear innovation. I think, you know, we should embrace it. It's, it's kind of, you know, I think it kind of what, it, it helps us kind of get out of bed every morning. So I, I'm not worried about it. I think it's a good thing if we've, if we've come up with new ways to solve problems. I think Mike said, said it well a little bit earlier about how difficult it is going to be, though, for, like, the companies that are trying to go after this problem with more and more point solutions because more complexity isn't going to help anything. Yeah, definitely in security, uh, keep up the change, keep up the innovation is very important. And uh, uh, because uh, th th these things happen so quick in this space. And that's where a lot of bigger company, uh, when they get bigger, is a, is a slow on the innovation, starting falling behind. And also a few, uh, especially in this space, is uh, stay uh, like uh, hands-on involved in the technical things. Uh, 
actually will, will, will see, get you to see the picture better and also more close to the customer also much important uh, because uh, innovation is the key in this space and uh, you always need to keep in, uh, keep in uh, hands on involved and eventually you can build the best product uh, in the cutting edge product. You know, I think at Silicon Valley, we love to celebrate the startup and what's happening that's innovative. But I bet if we had the time, we could each talk for an hour on what's the innovative things that are happening in our company. So it's happening in large companies too. You don't have to look very far, Apple. Uh, it's happening in Silicon Valley in total and even broader around the world. So uh, I love startups, but they don't have a lock on innovation. It's happening everywhere around us. We couldn't survive as companies if we weren't. Uh, actively fostering that innovation inside the companies as well as studying what's going on outside. And uh, I fear bloggers. So. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our friends. <laughs> I'd like to thank our speakers for sharing your perspective so freely and for the humor to boot. I'm sure everybody appreciates that. And Danny for leading the conversation so well. As a very small token of our appreciation, we have for you the Churchill Club Speaker T-shirt. A recording of this program will be available shortly on our YouTube channel where you will find recordings of most of our other programs as well. We hope you find that to be a useful resource. And you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. See you next time. Good night. <laughs>